Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Mississippi DOT Yields High Return on Investments with Microservicing Project call. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero. This conference is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the call over to your host, Jason Dietz. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. As Jenny mentioned, my name is Jason Dietz, and I'm with the Federal Highway Resource Center. And we're partnering today with the Payment Preservation and Recycling Alliance, PPRA, on a series of these pavement preservation webinars focusing on pavement preservation, keeping good roads good. You'll see a number of polls up on your screen. We ask you to take a moment to answer those, as we will close them in just a few minutes as the presentation begins. We encourage questions. So during the webinar, um, we ask you to please take a moment of time and respond, as well as we have some evaluations at the end. Please take the time at the end of the webinar to respond to them as well, because we use those for future webinars as, as time permits. Today's webinar will focus on Mississippi DOT's yield high return on investments with microservicing. All attendees are on mute, but you can submit any questions to the chat function on your screen, and we will answer those as time permits. We will offer PDHs for today's webinar upon request. So please, in the chat pod, uh, spell your first and last name and let me know if you need a PDHs. So please do that. This month's webinar is hosted by the International Slurry Association, ISSA, and now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Tim Harwood, the manager of Southern Contracting Division of Vance Brothers Incorporated. His area of operation includes Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. He started his career in the slurry, seal, and microservice industry 32 years ago in Little Rock, Arkansas. Kim has participated in the placement of slurry, seal, and microservicing in multi-states, along with the several Central American countries. He has served as an ISSA Airport and Specification Committee member and chaired the slurry seal, associate, slurry seal workshop for seven years. Tim served on the ISSA Board of Directors for eight years and served as the president of the International Slurry Seal Association in 2010. He served as a chairman of ISSA Technical Marketing, Webinar, and Web-Based Training Committee, which produced, which produced three great uh, web-based training modules through a cooperative agreement with the Federal Highway Administration and ISSA. He currently serves as a vice president of the Foundation of Pavement Preservation, FP2, and sits as a committee that helps design and implement the current preservation group study at the National Center of Asphalt Technology at Auburn University. Tim, on behalf of PPR and FHWA, I want to thank you for your time today, and we'll now go ahead and pass it over to you. Hi, Jason, thank you so much for that introduction. And we'll get going here just as soon as uh, you take the, the, um, the questions down. Okay, first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to join us for this uh, great job story on a Mississippi microservicing project that has yielded high returns for the DOT down there that uh, still today serves as the wearing course on this road as it goes into its 17th year after placement. This job is in Tunica County, Mississippi, uh, just south of Memphis. Uh, it was an award-winning project in uh, 2020. Uh, that award was the ISSA uh, Preservation Performance Award. And that award has been established to recognize and honor at least one pavement preservation project that proves the long-term performance and network enhancement of pavement preservation. Uh, the award is presented to both the owner agency or engineering firm that specified and managed the project and the member contractor that completed the work as well. Why was this project nominated? Well, in 2005, Mississippi Department of Transportation, MDOT, District 2 out of Batesville, chose microservicing to treat a 12-mile section of Highway 61 in Tunica County. Uh, the project started at the northern city limits of Tunica, Mississippi, and went north 12 miles to the DeSoto County line. This project, 
has extended the service life of that pavement well beyond expectations, as you'll see through this presentation. It's still providing a durable wearing surface with friction values well above the acceptable limits. So a lot of safety enhancements came along with this project, and, and they still are in effect today. The one thing that's really nice to know is no additional work has been required on this stretch of on this 12 mile stretch of highways since 2005. And that factors uh, greatly into uh, MoDOT's opinion of how this project is performing. So a little program scope. Uh, in 2005, MDOT requested proposals to treat this 12 mile section, which is a multi-lane divided highway in Tunica County, Mississippi. And at the time, Tunica was one of the nation's largest gambling meccas. Since then, it's declined a little bit, but they still have a lot of casinos there and still have high volume traffic out there. Um, Tunica County or Tunica, the, the gambling was so impressive there and, and so well liked that it was uh, third in line behind Las Vegas and Atlantic City. So pretty good following as far as the gamblers were concerned. MDOT wanted to reprofile this highway, adding a durable wearing course and, and getting some condition improving benefits and life extension out of the microservicing. And for this particular project, they only wanted to treat the driving lanes. Shoulders were gravel and at intersections, you had left turn lanes and things of that nature that were not treated. <clears throat> the traffic counts at the time this project was completed was over 13,000 vehicles to de um, a day. Uh, most of that was uh, was gambling traffic, uh, but a lot of it also was truck traffic and agricultural traffic um, from the area. And it's nice to know, or it's important to note, that uh, about 15, 16 miles up the road is Memphis, Tennessee, which is an enormous trucking hub with the intersections of I-55 and Interstate 40, um, which goes east and west and 55 north and south. So big trucking mecca there as well. The project goals for, for, from MDOT's perspective was they wanted to extend the pavement life from six to eight years. They wanted to, to halt oxidation, the future oxidation of the pavement and, and any potentially raveling that they were experiencing. Additionally, they wanted to address some minor rutting. They wanted to improve their IRI or International Roughness Index. They wanted to address some minor or moderate cracking, and they wanted to increase the friction values of the surface uh, for safety to the traveling public. With the overview, again, Mississippi Department of Transportation is the owner of this pavement. Uh, it's under the uh, oversight of District 2 out of Batesville. The project number was MP-2061-7204 in the whole. Uh, the project name was Tunica County City Limits, north to DeSoto County Line. Uh, for those of you that know Northeast Mississippi, you would know that that's right smack dab in the middle of Hollywood, Mississippi. Uh, many of you probably didn't know that there was such a place, but it does exist. Um, the bid date was in July of 2005. Uh, the contract was uh, inked in August of 2005, and the contract bid price was $1,135,577.50. Um, attached to that were uh, the restrictions of 120 calendar days. So pretty pretty tight schedule, but uh, but it was met. So ultimately, you had 48 lane miles total on this project for a million one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. Okay, the existing pavement was a dense graded hot mix asphalt, and again the distresses were oxidation, some light raveling, minor rutting, and moderate cracking. This project was started in August of 2005 and the completion date was the end of September of 2005. So it really took about a month to do. That includes all items, including uh, final striping and raised pavement markers. Contractor on the job, Vance Brothers Incorporated, Southern Contracting Division. Let's talk a little bit about materials. The emulsion was provided by Ergon Asphalt and Emulsions, Vicksburg, Mississippi plant. 
the designation was a CSS 1 HP microservicing emulsion, and the quantity used was approximately 204,500 gallons. The aggregate was provided by Vulcan Materials Company out of Grand Rivers, Kentucky. It was a, a Vulcan Black 11s material, very dark color, uh, very nice aggregate to work with. It passed the Mississippi Type 5 aggregate specification, which is a mirror image of the ISSA's Type 3 gradation for microsurfacing. Uh, the project called for the first lift or scratch code or scratch cores to be placed at 25 pounds of dry rock per square yard, followed by a second lift or the surface course applied at 20 pounds of dry rock per, per square yard. So a total of 45 pounds of rock in two applications per square yard is what the specifications required. Mineral filler was supplied, uh, which was Portland Cement, and it was provided by Ash Grove Cement out of Memphis, Tennessee. The mixed design was performed and provided by Paragon Technical Services, and the job mix formula within that mixed design called for 11% asphalt emulsion, plus or minus 1%, and 1% mineral filler. We ran on that optimum content because the goal, one of the goals of the project was to actually reprofile that road and do some minor rut filling while doing so. There were some unique challenges um, with this project, and one of them was a severe weather event uh, that happened right during the middle of the project, and that was Hurricane Katrina, <clears throat> which made landfall on the coast of Mississippi in, uh, on August 29th of 2005. Although North Mississippi did not suffer the devastation experienced on the coast, the job was shut down for several days due to heavy rain and wind. Traffic increased as uh, people evacuated southern Mississippi and Louisiana. In fact, the hotel where the crew was staying uh, tried to force the crew out of the hotel so they could charge higher rates to those evacuees. And it took a good, good bit of discussion with the corporate headquarters of that hotel chain uh, to change that situation. Um, of course, some of the other issues were the casino traffic, uh, casino traffic on the north end of the project. Multiple intersections um, created a lot of difficulties, um, and there was just a lot of traffic up there. We also had a lot of agricultural traffic, as it is an agricultural area outside of the casinos. And a lot of truck traffic as well. Um, I don't know the percentage, but like I said, Memphis was a hub for this, and it was only about 16 miles north. And even though my slides are a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, disconfigured here because it's a smaller deal, Katrina was an enormous weather event for both Louisiana and Mississippi that created about 125 billion in property damage. Um, there were also 1,833 fatalities that went along with that, that hurricane. So it was absolutely devastating. And having been in North Mississippi for, for the greater part of my adult life doing work, I can assure you I've never experienced a, a weather event such as, as Katrina when it came through. Uh, again, I can't imagine what it was like six hours south on the coast, but it was uh, still packing a good punch as it reached North Mississippi and, and went into Tennessee. So it, it was a, a rather uh, difficult storm to deal with, and we had a lot of obstacles uh, during that storm and after that storm that we had to contend with uh, right in the middle of the project. So let's talk about some successes here. 15-year um, life extension, that's actually 16 years. Last year, uh, made the 16th year and, and this year as that microsurfacing still provides the final wearing surface, we're going into our 17th year. So we've got to keep that in mind. That's, that's more than double the life expectation uh, from, from what you might typically see across the country, and it's surely more than double the expectations of Mississippi Department of Transportation. Um, who are the benefactors from that? obviously the DOT and the taxpayers, but the end, user, end users have enjoyed a more durable wearing course 
uh, that's been able to provide great friction numbers throughout the entire life of the treatment, all while withstanding a lot of heavy traffic volumes. And doing all of this with a limestone aggregate. Many folks um, have a misconception that limestone aggregates cannot provide good friction values over time, but with microsurfacing and our micro and macro texture, we're very capable of providing those uh, long-term great friction values throughout the life of the treatment. And this job is not only proof of that, but all of the information that we've learned uh, from the NCAT Min Roads uh, Preservation Group study that's been ongoing since 2012 would indicate the same exact information. So let's look at some of the numbers. You can see that the pavement condition index rating in 2006 was an 89. In 2010, it was an 84, and in 2018, it's still a 79. I can't tell you what those numbers are right now, but I can assure you that they're still in a very acceptable range after 16 years of, of serving as the, as the final wearing surface. The IRI, very acceptable, 56.1 in 06, 55.9 in 2010, and a 64.1 in 2018. All good numbers, rutting the same way. You can see very, very minor rutting in, in 2006, 2010, and 2018. One of the really impressive uh, things about this, again, is the friction values. Um, in 2011, it was a 37.7, and in 2017, it was a 37.25. So you can see the consistency of those friction values that were measured with a, with a rib tire measurement. Uh, they've held steady throughout the course of, uh, of performance of this project and, and are still doing extremely well today. That is an enormous value uh, to the department and to the traveling public uh, on that roadway. Project costs, some more impressive numbers to consider here. The all-inclusive price per lane mile on this, and remember, there's 48 lane miles, uh, is $23,657.86. That cost included microsurfacing, mobilization, maintenance of traffic, and all of the pavement markings. So that's uh, both temporary and permanent pavement markings. So that's all inclusive. Uh, there are no, no hidden costs that, uh, that you need to consider there. That's, that's the full deal. Um, contract price divided by uh, lane miles divided by years, and that's, that's how you come up with that number. To take it a little bit further, the annualized cost of this $1.135 million project, which was completed actually over 16 years ago, is a little over $1,500 per lane mile. Or if we want to dial it down to the square yard price, you're looking at uh, about 22 and a half cents per square yard. That's pretty impressive, and I'm sure any agency uh, would love to have those type of prices today uh, and that kind of performance. So the results are in. By treating Highway 61, which obviously was the right pavement, microsurfacing was the right treatment, and 2005 obviously was the right time, um, MDOT not only improved the performance and extended the life of the roadway and improved the condition, but they've been able to, able to repurpose millions of dollars that would have been required for rehabilitation had these treatments had this treatment not performed so well. So pretty impressive uh, performance over time with this treatment. The financial impact. And this is a this is a quote from Mitch Turner, the MDOT District Two engineer, where he quoted this 12 mile section of four lane highway having a treatment on it that has lasted over 15 years has allowed MDOT to reallocate the three to four million dollars that we would have otherwise or typically spent on a mill and fill or something comparable, times two or three. So it's been well worth it, and in his opinion, microservicing should be part of their toolbox. So District 2 engineer very pleased with the outcome. The executive director, by taking preventative steps, it protects the roads foundation and prevents expensive reconstruction and rehabilitation projects. This preventative treatment has been very successful. Well, I, I concur with uh, Mrs. McGrath 
that uh, this job has performed uh, well above expectations and has done a very good job keeping that road in good shape for the traveling public. So let's just take a, a little bit of a photo tour. And uh, you can see the crew applying to microsurfacing at one of the intersections close to the uh, casino road. Uh, you can see that it's a busy intersection and, and uh, they're going to broadcast a little bit of the same stone in the microsurfacing that you see piled up there on the right with a shovel in it, they'll take that and they'll lightly broadcast it over the microservicing so that they can get return traffic across that intersection in, in more rapid fashion without damaging the microservicing or allowing materials uh, to get on the, the traveling public's vehicles. So good operation, just an idea of what it looked like back in 2005. You can see the big casino sign behind the microservicing machine after they went through the intersection. Just kind of an idea of, of what it looked like. And had I known I was going to be given a presentation in 2022, I would have taken many more pictures to show you guys. But um, who knew at the time what, what and how this project was going to turn out down the line. So here's a picture of, of some curing microsurfacing that was placed earlier in the day. The temporary markings uh, at this time um, were a painted uh, marking that had to be installed on a daily basis because of the high volume traffic nature on the roadway. So at the end of each day, we had to have a striping company come in, lay it out, and put markings on this road uh, before we could open it to traffic. So that was one of the, uh, I guess you'd say, a, an obstacle or, or one of the hoops we had to jump through on a daily basis to maintain the safety of the traveling public throughout the whole time this project was was being worked on, and it and it worked very well. We worked very well with the uh, with the striping contractor, and you can see here this this was the first lift um, in the southbound lane, and you can see that the center line stripe was not obliterated. That was done on purpose, so it didn't have to be striped that day, but the shoulder line did have to be striped. So that's what you're seeing in this picture. This is a picture of, of some of the minor rutting up uh, on the north end of the project up near the casinos. Uh, just some consolidation ruts. It uh, wasn't terrible, but definitely something that uh, could create a hydroplaning situation and uh, definitely had a bearing on the, on the safety for the traveling public. You can see kind of the same area after the microsurfacing was applied and permanent striping was installed. A very acceptable job. Uh, took care of the rutting issues, uh, uh, instilled some nice friction values out there and created a much uh, safer traveling situation for, for the public. Another picture of the completed project that was taken in 2005. Some of the things that, that I like to note about this picture was the uniformity of surface texture across the full width of both lanes and, and almost the appearance of, of no longitudinal joint down the, the skip stripes on this highway. You know, the crew that installed this work uh, did a fantastic job at uh, installing that longitudinal joint, um, which is something that we strive for every day and, and something that agencies uh, sh should require and demand. So some side-by-side -side stuff. Uh, the picture on the left, you can see 2005, how it looked. And uh, the most recent picture I have of it is from 2017. Still doing extremely well, some, some light oxidation, but performing well above expectations um, after a lot of years there. But a good comparison of what it looked like in 05 versus 2017. In 2020, we, we've got a nice drone shot of one of the sections out there. Again, the project is still doing well. and. Um, and still today, in 2022, it is the final wearing surface on that roadway. What would I have done differently had I oppor had the opportunity to go back and do this job again? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I would have taken more pictures. But probably more importantly, I would have uh, done a little bit more work or encouraged a little bit more work around the intersections where the rutting was uh, just a little too severe for us to handle with a, a typical microsurfacing. And when I say that, uh, and I only say that this when, when we're talking about areas uh, in intersections where you have some pushing and shoving. And you can see 
by the uh, the stop bar there that there's definitely some movement in that pavement and you know we encourage that 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 material that had been pushing and shoving be removed and replaced prior to the job you know it, it wasn't something that that industry had a lot of control over uh, and you can see there was an attempt made to come in and and shallow up those ruts somewhat but it still didn't take away from the fact that much of that asphalt uh, had been moving and pushing and shoving over time and uh, laying a microsurfacing on top of that probably not going to yield you very good results. Now, the microsurfacing is still performing there, but, but the rutting came back pretty quick in those intersections because of that unstable mix that we were applying the microsurfacing to. So, when, when we find ourselves in this situation, uh, we highly recommend that they come in and, and remove that pushing and shoving asphalt, replace it with a good mix, and then apply the microsurfacing over that. And uh, I, I think you'll yield much better long-term um, results when you do that. So let's talk about some of the keys to success. See if I can you know, bring, it, bring into frame here what it takes to potentially get this type of success or success on any project. First of all, proper site selection. Like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, it was the right treatment on the right road at the right time, even though there's a few intersections that had, had some unstable asphalt on it. If those were addressed fine, we would no issues whatsoever. So proper site selection was really made except for a few minor areas good specifications. Mississippi does have good specifications in effect and, and those specifications were enforced. If you don't have good specs and you don't enforce them, um, you, you leave yourself vulnerable for failure. Want proper roadway preparation and, and in this case, you know, there wasn't a lot of preparation. High volume traffic generally keeps the road pretty clean, um, but with the agricultural traffic and, and combines and big tractors coming out on it, the possibility uh, is inevitable for those guys to track mud out of the fields onto the roadway. And that stuff had to be treated on a regular basis to make sure that we could ensure a good bond between the microsurfacing and, and the existing asphalt. Uh, that was achieved by staying on top of that roadway preparation. And so that was great. That would have, that would have fallen under the final category of preparation. The early category would have would have uh, led you to those intersections and, and a full depth patch in those areas to remove that uh, pushing and shoving asphalt and replacing it with, uh, with a, a good new mix. Proper equipment. This, like I said, 48 lane miles, no turning lanes, no intersections. So it was obvious to uh, MDOT that a continuous lay machine was uh, the right type of equipment for this project, and that's what was specified. Um, from By doing that, they ensured um, continuity of mix and reduction of, um, of transverse construction joints, and generally speaking, a lot higher production rate, which keeps a contractor on the job for a shorter period of time, and it puts normal traffic back on that road in a quicker fashion. So both very desirable things. Thorough and accurate mix design. You know, Paragon did a great job evaluating the component materials that were submitted prior to the job. They came up and, and, and determined what the optimum rate of application was going to be. As a contractor, we stuck to that. We stuck to those optimum uh, application rates and, and optimum emulsion and cement content. And, and because of that, we've been able to experience the long-term performance that, that we're talking about today. Accurate equipment calibration. You know, I, I can't say um, enough about how important calibration of the equipment is. Uh, I mentioned just prior to this uh, about mixed designs. You know, if we spend the time and effort to evaluate these materials uh, just on their own properties and combine through the performance testing uh, to determine what our optimum contents and, and, and job mix formula should be, if we as contractors do not perform an accurate calibration in the presence of the buyer's authorized representative and, and we go out there and not know what percentage we're laying, then we are absolutely vulnerable 
to, uh, to a lesser performance and or failure. So it's important that contractors calibrate their equipment prior to startup on every job they do. Um, you know, I used to think that uh, if you did one every three months or six months, it's probably a good way to go and insured quality, but nothing insured quality more than calibrating prior to each job in the presence of, of the agency's representative. And, and when you do that, not only does it uh, verify to the contractor installing the materials that his machine is still performing as, as he thinks it is, but it also gives the agency that they're working for a comfort level uh, that the contractor is providing a mix that is consistent with that approved job mix formula. So again, if you take nothing else away from this, this presentation, you need to know that calibration and, and calibrating to the mix design is extremely important. Test strips. Uh, test strips really weren't specified back when this project was done, uh, but I can ensure you uh, that at startup of that project, um, all eyes uh, were on the material, making sure that uh, the application rates were correct, making sure the job mix formula was like it should be, making sure that we had good uniformity of surface texture, uh, making sure that the equipment was working um, as designed and didn't have hydraulic leaks or aggregate leaks from the conveyors. You know, there's a lot of things that you have to consider when evaluating test strips. And, and those things, even though they weren't specified when this job was done, uh, I can guarantee you it was something that was what was evaluated at the very start of that, of that project and throughout the project for that matter. Material consistency. I always like to use the term, we, we want to use material with the history of past performance. And in this case, we did uh, a, a lot of history with those materials and gives you a very good comfort level going into the job. Now, this doesn't mean that we're opposed to looking at new material sources. We do that on a, on a consistent basis, but there's, there's nothing better than going into a project where you know that these materials work well together. So past performance is a good thing. Optimal application rate. You know, that's, that's something that we have to meet uh, every, everywhere we go. If, if you're applying a, a material too thin uh, or at a low application rate, you're not going to get the embedment of the larger particles of aggregate. And because of that, you might experience some, some raveling or things of that nature. But ultimately, lack of performance over time can, can, can be an issue. Uh, conversely, if you overapply the material, you can get 100% embedment of your largest particles of aggregate and have more of a slick kind of a, a flushed type of, of surface that won't provide good friction values over time. <clears throat> so it's good to know what your optimal application rates with, with typical aggregates that are available in your area are. And if, and if you don't know what those are, consult with industry, uh, you know, because there's a lot of history with uh, the materials that are being used and those rates can be can be determined through discussion and then specified to where you get good performance long term. Screening of all aggregates. And I know not everybody across the country can do this because of dust abatement rules and things of that nature. But in, in our geographic location where we work, uh, we screen 100% of our aggregate directly into the truck. And what this does is it eliminates any possibility of oversized material uh, getting into the to the nurse truck, making it to the lay-down machine, getting hung under the screed, creating drag marks, which then creates a situation where you have to perform handwork, and that has a negative effect on uniformity of surface texture, and not that it won't perform well in that area, but it, it def definitely has a negative cosmetic, um, you know, value to it. So screening of aggregates is, is, is a huge factor, in my opinion, as well. Contractor performance. Um, you know, we want to use a well, well-trained, well-seasoned um, workforce, and uh, of course, that's more difficult now in 2022 as as it was then. And hopefully, the world will correct itself before long in this post-COVID world, and we can kind of get back to normal. And and uh, well-trained, well-seasoned uh, workforces are are going to be more available. But contractor performance, big deal. 
and it's up to the agency performing the oversight to kind of you know require that that performance takes place. Herbicide treatments, when necessary, really doesn't apply to this job, but on on many jobs with uh, open ditches and gravel shoulders, things of that nature. If you've got vegetation out there, need to treat it a couple of weeks prior to contractor mobilization. That way it'll kill that grass and it will also uh, hinder its future growth. Quality project inspection. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we find ourselves in the contracting industry uh, hearing the words that we don't know much about your product so if you will perform us a good job and it performs for us, we will use it again. Um, so, so sometimes we see agencies actually taking themselves out of the mix uh, because of their unfamiliarity with the treatment. Um, those of, of you that are with agencies that are here today, obviously doing your due diligence, trying to bring yourself up to speed with that familiarity where you can perform good oversight on these projects because it is necessary not all contractors are alike and um, and and a good oversight will help provide a, a good ending to a project and long-term performance public notification uh, again on a multi-lane divided highway in in a situation like this doesn't require a lot of it but in most cases somebody um, lives on the road subdivisions leading out onto the road, things of that nature. And if we take the time as both agencies and, and applicators to notify the public of what's going on, uh, it'll be a huge benefit to both. Uh, if, if the public understands what's going on and knows how to react as they come to the work zone, uh, we are far better off uh, as contractors and we create a much safer situation than we, than we would have if the public is unaware of, of what's going on and have not been notified. Agency industry relationship, I, I use the term partnering, and I don't use that in, in a legal sense, but ultimately agencies and, and industry people, as far as applicators, have the same desire. We want that project to come out the best that it can come out with uh, the, the best that it, we can do. And I have found that when agencies and industries work together towards that common goal, that the end results are always better than when the agency and the applicator might be in an adversarial type situation. Not saying that happens a lot, but but I think if uh, at the beginning of projects, if, if those relationships are, are built, the outcome is almost always better than it would have otherwise been. So good agency industry partnering and relationships, valuable asset. And then information. You know, all of you are here today to gain information on what can help you uh, either design or apply or perform oversight on a project. And there's tons of information out there that, that can help you achieve those goals and, and I applaud you for being here to, to gain that information. Some of the ways you can do that uh, is through the FHWA PPRA webinar series. Now these are just two of, um, of the webinars that have taken place in 2021 that can help folks with limited familiarity of microsurfacing gain a higher level of understanding about the treatments and, and how they should be applied. You can see the links here. These webinars have been recorded. Uh, you can go to them and watch them at your leisure. And, and again, they will help you immensely if, if you're not familiar with these treatments. Uh, um, and like I said, whether you're an applicator, uh, somebody performing oversight, or somebody you know designing a project, these type webinars can help you. And of course, Jason will We'll share with you maybe a little bit more, but there's a lot of webinars out there on anything from recycling to emulsions to chip seals to crack seals to microsurfacings and things of that nature. So a ton of information out there, if, uh, and, and it's free and available at, uh, at your leisure. So go find it, look at it, and, and we'll all be better off in the end because of it. So some of the resources you, you may consider is the PPRA Road Resource. Um, 
International Slurry Surfacing Association at slurry.org, and the FP2, which is formerly the Foundation for Pavement Preservation, at fp2.org, and again, to be redundant, uh, roadresource.org to find a lot of information on these treatments. Ms. Alley, I will uh, turn it over to you at this point so you can plug the next webinar coming down the line. Thanks, Tim. Um, great pre presentation. Um, our next webinar in our series will be um, scrub seal pavement treatments. Um, Stan Williams with Ergon Asphalt Emulsions will be presenting on March 17th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone there. I'll give it back to Jason and Tim. Okay. Thanks, Allie. So, some, some contact information on this project. Uh, you can see the information from Mitch Turner there, uh, District 2 um, uh, engineer, or District Engineer for Mississippi DOT. Information to where you can contact me uh, is below that. And, and don't hesitate if you have any questions about this presentation or, or anything uh, to do with uh, microsurfacing or chip seals or anything like that. Uh, feel free to, to give me a and And with that, I'll kind of close with, you know, this, this is a unique project that, again, has performed way better than expectations could have ever been on, on this particular highway, particular treatment. And, you know, I don't think you can have this level of expectation on most of your projects, um, but I can assure you that if you follow those keys or secrets to success, and if everybody in, involved in the project, from the design to the oversight to the application, if everybody is up to speed um, on what those keys to success are, and they follow them and, and they do their jobs, then I think you're more likely to have um, projects that perform above expectation level. So. Uh, let, let's strive for that as we move forward, work together, and I think it'll all be better in the long run. And with that, I'll answer any questions you may have. And thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate where your line is open. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the star key followed by the digit 2. If you're on speakerphone, please make, pick up the handset before pressing the corresponding digits. Once again, press star 1 at this time for questions, and we'll pause a moment. Tim, we have one question in the chat pod regarding, do you happen to know anything about the ADDTs on the roadways for the preservation the treatments? The ADDT, uh, when the job was done in 2005, it was over 13,000. Uh, I looked at it about a year ago, and it was somewhere between 10,000 and 11,000. So, um, because of the, you know, there's been a slight decrease in the volume of traffic, but it's still considered high volume. Thanks. Then I had another question. What are the main differences in uh, Mississippi DOT's microsurfacing spec and ISA, ISSA spec? Are there any differences? Well, there, there's Don't always you know going to be uh, the, the ISSA recommended performance guideline is, is, is out there so that designers or agencies can use it as a tool to help them build their specifications. Um, there are some agencies that adopt those recommended performance guidelines as their verbatim specification. Um, that does happen, but, but what we really promote is that they use that guideline to help build their specification and taking into account uh, local sources of material, um, geographic locations, uh, everything you could ever imagine. You need to be a little bit more site specific about these things. What what works in Phoenix, Arizona, may not but be what you need in uh, New Hampshire. And, and vice versa. So, you know, you need to put in things that are specific to your area. Um, I can tell you Mississippi specification on materials, I think, is almost a, 
a mere image of what ISSA calls for. Um, the specification that we used in 2005 has since been uh, updated uh, to encompass all of the different uh, best practice methods and things of that nature that have, have come to light since 2005. So, you know, you don't really like to see 25-year-old specifications out there being used. You like to see those things uh, updated on a regular basis so they can, you know, put in new equipment specifications, new best practices, the information on test strips and calibrations and, and, and things of that nature need to be part of those specs. So the ISSA recommended performance guidelines is definitely a great place to start. Um, so there are a ton of similarities between MDOT and ISSA, but there are some, some specific differences as well. Thanks, Tim. And another question, um, was the TAC code used for this project? No, sir. TAC coat was not used on this project. And in, in fact, um, in the areas of our operation, TAC coat uh, is not required. Uh, we do not have any delamination issues uh, in the south. So, no, TAC coat was not used. Thank you. By chance, would you happen to know what the PCI for that roadway was before treatment? I do not. Okay. The PCI numbers that I, I was privileged to get came after installation. Okay. And after installation, do you have an idea what those numbers were? I do. I showed that um, on a slide earlier in the presentation. I'm not looking at it right now. Sure. But I think in 2017, it was around a 79 or, or 80, if I remember correctly. Thank you. And do we know what the overall thickness of the applied microservicing was? Well, no. Um, and, and the reason we don't know on thickness is because it's a very difficult uh, thin applied material to measure thickness. Um, and we quantify uh, our material by application rate. And, and again, that's why it is so important that we do those calibrations because not only does it it verify that we're producing a mix that meets the job mix formula, but we can always we can also use those factors determine app to determine what the application rate is and what our overall material usage is on a daily, weekly, monthly, project wise basis. So no, we typically don't don't measure thickness. Uh, I hate to even guess, I would probably have to, if I was to guess, I would probably have to say uh, getting close to three quarters of an inch. But again, that, that's very difficult to measure with, with this thin applied treatment. Thanks, Tim. I have another question. Uh, slurry seals are often being specified as latex modified. What is the difference between a latex modified slurry seal and a microservicing? Well, first of all, it would be the specification. Um, across the country, you'll find that slurry seals can be specified as latex modified from anywhere from 1 to 2 to 3 percent polymer content. Microsurfacing has a minimum of 3 percent polymer requirement to it. Uh, one of the other big factors that you'll find is the mix design requirements. Um, microsurfacing uh, performance criteria is much more stringent than that of a slurry seal. Um, you know, with lateral displacements and, and performance tests like that. So specifications, first of all, um, mix design criteria, second of all. Thanks, Tim. Another question? Is it advisable to use a microservicing on top of an open graded material? Well, as any good technical response requires me to, to answer, it depends. Uh, we, we've done a lot of open graded friction course over the years, and we've had an enormous amount of success, but it is contingent upon the condition of that open graded friction course. If you're experiencing some raveling, loss of aggregate, uh, or stripping, things of that nature, 
probably not a good candidate for any thin non-structural surface treatment, let alone microsurfacing. So it really requires a, a good evaluation uh, measure to determine where that OGFC is in its life. Uh, but, but yes, it, it, it can work, it has worked, it will work, but you have to do your due diligence when, when choosing the, the site. Thanks, Tim. Another question, how long does uh, base material repairs have to be in place prior to a microservicing? Well, I think it, it, it's really kind of more critical with a chip seal style treatment. Uh, we all know how uh, base failures or base failure repairs or full depth patching can be rather absorptive uh, with a with a spray spray applied treatment. Uh, and in those cases, it's typically at least a, a minimum of 14 days cure period. Like I said, it's not as critical with microsurfacing, um, but but a little bit of cure time is not bad. Um, we really don't see that specified in, in our area much, except from one agency, and that agency treats everything the same, whether it be a thin hot mix overlay, a chip seal, or a microsurfacing, they require 14 days. Um, but you also have to know that scheduling contractors, uh, you know, generally going to give you a little bit of time because generally the contractor doing the patching is going to be different than the contractor performing the, the microsurfacing installation. So there's always going to be some lag of time in between those two processes. Um, but like I said, it's not as critical. We really don't see delamination issues um, with that scenario with microsurfacing, but, but I can't say that a little cure time doesn't hurt any. I, I can't say that it hurts anything, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Thanks Tim. And I know us out west, um, some states, we have like a three-month period that we try to shoot for, and that way it gives us some time to cure and be able to withstand that, but good answer. Sure. Um, is there a lag time between the first and second layers of how long one should wait before applying a second layer of, say, a microsurfacing? Yes. Um, ISSA recommends that a minimum of 24 hours expire before putting the surface course on top of a scratch course or a rut filling. Um, and that's to allow for return traffic compaction and a little consolidation uh, before you go over it. I can tell you how we try to address all of our two-lift application uh, treatments uh, as far as microsurfacing goes, we like to do 100% of, of our first course first, and then we'll start back over uh, installing our surface treatment. So there's uh, generally a good bit of time that goes by before we put our surface treatment on top of it. But as a minimum, ISSA recommends uh, 24 hours. Thank you. All right, I open it up for any other people who have any questions. And there's there's one other question that just came in. Would you give the pros and cons of specifying bidding microsurfacing by weight versus square yard? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, some agencies like the square yard. Uh, unit item simply because on the day the project bids, they know what their cost exposure is going to be. Um, and the only way that cost exposure will change is if they change the amount of square yards um, to apply the, the, the material to. So for instance, if they start with 100,000 square yards, the job ends at 100,000 square yards, they know, there's no surprises at the end, what their cost is going to be. Now, having said that, that doesn't make their job of oversight easier because they need to be diligent in performing that oversight and making sure that the application rates that are specified are being met. Um, those application rates can be tied directly to overall performance. And if, if it's something that they're not uh, looking after on a, a multiple time a day basis, then, then they can create some issues. So we do a lot of square yard work. We do a lot of ton and gallon work. We're fine with either 
process. But uh, that's why an agency may like square yards, and it's the square yards never changes. You know, they know what it is before the job. At the end of the job, it's very easy to go back out and measure the area that was covered. Uh, undisputable surface area measurement. Um, pretty easy. No, no, no reason that uh, an agency and an industry can't come to an agreement on quantity supply. When you go to ton and gallon, uh, you have to employ a different method of measurement. And it requires a little bit of work, but it can be done. It's done day in and day out. And, you know, that way the contractor gets paid for every gallon he puts down and for every ton he puts down. And the agency only pays for the gallons and tons that were applied. Um, but, again, it does require that. Now, we have seen, you know, cases where, you know, square yard jobs in a highly competitive situation, um, contractors may tend to edge towards the lower end uh, of the job mix formula on emulsion content, and that can create a situation where you might see some premature wear down the line and not get the longevity out of the project that you might desire, whereas if you specified ton and gallon, then that contractor has every incentive to stay towards the optimum side of that job mix formula and apply those those tons and gallons uh, accordingly. So that, that may be one of the advantages that you may look at. If, if you're having some issues, uh, especially with premature wear from the top down, that may indicate that, that the binder content is a little bit lower than it should have been. Great. Thanks for your comments on that. Well, I, again, I'd like to open it. If anybody has any questions, feel free to get if you want to mind giving them the commands. And thank you. As a reminder, it is star one for questions. That is star one if you would like to ask a question on the phone. At this time, there are no questions in the phone queue. Great. All right. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Tim, for your time today. And now I'd like to turn it over for you for any closing remarks. Well, again, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, don't hesitate to contact me with any additional questions you may have, either by phone or email. And uh, if, if I don't know the answer, I, I know the person who will. So, like I said, don't hesitate. And, again, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. And that concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Teleconference service. You may now disconnect.